Welcome to Uprising, Omar. Thank you for having me. Well, this has been a very interesting year for you, mm -hmm. not just um, personally, I'm sure, but of course, uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. uh, you started your um, commentary on the Arab Spring with the collaboration Jan 25th that mm -hmm. you uh, performed with a number of other artists, and you've moved on with, given what's been happening in Syria for over a year, uh, with music focused on that. How has it been for you to write about these issues that are so near and dear to your mm. to your heart? Um, well, first of all, just to back up, thank you so much for having me on the program. Uh, KPFK has always been so supportive of my work, and so uh, it's always good to be back here. Um, uh, with respect to this uh, stuff that I've been writing recently, it has been very difficult because, um, you know, for the first time I find myself in a position where <coughs> a things that I write could have a direct impact on the lives of people very near and dear to me overseas. Um, the Syrian regime has targeted uh, artists and artists' families for a long time, uh, and actually over the course of the last year, they've done some very horrific things to uh, the families of artists both living inside and outside, uh, kind of as, as a way to you know, maintain their, their, their fear tactics, um, which is what they thrived on for so long. Um, that said, uh, at the same time, it's also been interesting because as an American, I'm kind of used to s watching the news in a certain way, taking it in in a certain way, you know, seeing things on, on TV. And so I can almost relate to how the average American views what's happening in Syria. But then when I look a little deeper, I realize, oh, that, I know that street, or oh, my cousin lives there, or oh, such and such, you know. Um, so, you know, a lot of different things are floating around in my mind, but at the end of the day, um, I recognize the fact that I have this responsibility here. You know, that's something that I, I speak to my family members about often. Um, they say, you know, you have a voice, you have a platform, and, you know, a lot of people listen to you, and you need to get our message out there, especially when for so long it didn't seem like anybody, anybody was really paying attention to what was happening there. Um, and more importantly, when I think people... Uh, at least the media tends to flatten things out, you know, and turns them into these black and white things. They're either against or they're with, you know, um, and that's just simply not the case, especially in Syria. There's so many layers to it, and uh, that's what I've been trying to just remind people, you know, um, yeah, the, that beneath all the political posturing, all the conspiracy theories and the proxy wars, there's very real human suffering, and that this started as and will end as uh, a story between uh, the people and this regime. Mm. Everybody else doesn't matter as far as Syrians are concerned, you know. Tell about your relationship with Syria. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned you have a cousin living there, uh, but you were born in Saudi Arabia? Well, I was born in Saudi Arabia, but my immediate family moved back to Syria about a decade ago. Uh, my mother, my sister, her kids. Um, so they were all so, there now. So they were up until about a couple of months ago when it just got too hectic and they had to leave. Uh, obviously, the things that I've been doing uh, made it more difficult for them to stay as well. Wow. Uh, and I've also been given a, you know official persona non grata status as far as this uh, regime is concerned so um, it's been it's been difficult also I mean even prior to this whole uh, revolution taking place uh, recently um, my father's family my mother's family is from Damascus which is where they live but my father's family is from Hama uh, which in 1982 uh, had uh, suffered a, a horrific horrific um, basically uh, iron fist type of uh, uh, quelling of a of a rebellion there where they killed somewhere between 10 to 40 thousand people we'll never really know the exact numbers the overwhelming majority of them were innocent uh, people many women and children and they literally flattened they leveled raised uh, the the part of town uh, where my father's family was from uh, and they just plopped a big old hotel on top of it and so that's something that I've lived with for a very long time you know my father left and was never allowed to go back that's why I was born in Saudi Arabia that's why we came here uh, and and so and he was subsequently buried you know in the United States he passed away uh, in in the 90s and so that's something that went through my mind you know as all of this was happening it's like wow if I if I start speaking out now you know I'm basically sealing the same fate for myself but I know I'm making him proud I know I'm making you know my family proud I'm also making it difficult for my family as well on the other hand so it's a lot of stuff going through my mind as this is happening but you know 
what I what I always just did was put it in perspective of what the people in Syria were going through and 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 the sacrifices that they were making and realized that you know at the end of the day I can I can bear this burden because I know it's much more difficult for a lot of other people and and that they really need uh, you know people to speak out and to raise awareness and so when was the last time you were in Syria um, basically a few months before uh, this uh, uh, so and, in and early 2011 basically yeah and um, yeah like mid 2011 uh, no sorry Sorry, uh, mid-2010, before any of the revolutions began. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. What is, where, which part of Syria were you in? Uh, tell our listeners about the country. I mean, this is uh, something that we read about as yeah. a site of massacres and mm -hmm. battles. But uh, as, as a culture, as a country, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not something Americans know much about. No, and it's, it's really unfortunate because, honestly, I mean, I think it's, it's one of the most beautiful places on Earth, one of the longest, richest histories of coexistence. Existence, um, you know, many of the major uh, religions obviously had uh, either been born there or had a lot of influence um, in that region. Uh, it's it's very ethnically diverse, which is something a lot of people don't realize. There's Kurdish, Armenian, Assyrian, and Arab uh, people living there. Um, you know, it had opened its doors to refugees since the Armenian days, to Palestinians, to Iraqis. Um, it's the, the, the deep, deep history you can see just everywhere, you know, in every single city you have these old cities, these older quarters with the winding alleys and the, and the marketplaces, you know, the sweet fragrant smells of, of spices and, uh, you know, the jasmine trees. I mean, I could go on. I can't, I can't tell you how beautiful it is. And um, that was something that always bothered me as well, knowing that it had this type of beauty um, that that was being masked by this ugliness of, of a dictatorship where you would be forced to see the same face everywhere you go, forced to see the same statue everywhere you went, and people living in constant fear, afraid to speak out. Because of what happened in Hama, uh, they internalized this fear for so long that to the point where I know family members here and, fa and, and friends, whenever you mention the Assad family's name, they start to whisper, you know, and this was like... <laughs> thousands of miles away, you know, uh, but that shows you how much of an impact it had. It was never mentioned in the school books what happened in 1982, and, and that's how they got away with what they did for so long. And so, you know, it became this military state um, and, you know, secret police everywhere on every corner. And it's, uh, and you can see that manifesting today and, you know, the, 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 the extremely ugly side of that, you know. And now, with 17 months of this conflict, what has happened to that beauty? Um, well, you know, I believe that beauty is still there. Th th there, they'll never be able to take that away. Um, uh, it's unfortunately going through a very, you know, deep, dark chapter. But this, uh, like I said, is one of the oldest uh, and, and longest histories in the world, and this will just be a speed bump in that beautiful history, I believe, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very difficult one, you know, I'm not trying to belittle that, but I think uh, that's what gives me hope, and that's what gives Syrians hope, you know, that uh, that we'll be able to move past this and build something better, because, you know, it, it's... Uh, uh, the Syrian people themselves um, are not, like I said, uh, you, you can't flatten them out the way the media tends to, you know. Um, and this conflict is very multi-layered. It's, it's, it has roots um, in many different places. Uh, and obviously a lot of countries are trying to stake their claim in it. But at the end of the day, uh, the resolve of the Syrian people and, and their willingness to, to coexist in such a beautiful way um, is what I believe will really get us through. Uh, so I, w I want you to talk about the repression that artists like yourself have been facing. In particular, um, you've talked often in the press about Ibrahim Kashush. Mm -hmm. um, what was his story, and well, how um, did that affect you? Uh, a man from Hama, uh, who um, during the first few months of the revolution uh, was using his voice to, to speak out uh, and to uh, essentially, you know, we have this long history and tradition of uh, what we call uh, arada in Syria. It's like a nighttime kind of chanting, uh, and it usually involves free verse and hand drums and so poetry it's, and, and and yeah, poetry and celebrating like chanting, call and response chanting, you know, and and it celebrates. It typically was like the death of a family member or somebody coming back from Hajj or somebody getting married. Uh, but the second that these revolutions began, these immediately turned into revolutionary aradas every single night in all these different cities. And those were the protests uh, that, um, you know, were, were becoming the thorn in the side of the revolution. Very infectious rhythms and, and, and you know, they had different ones in different places. Uh, but given the history in Hema uh, and the fact that there was m very little support for the regime there from the actual population ever, uh, given what had happened, uh, these became very 
big popular, um, you know, arada events uh, each and every night, uh, muvaharas, you know, or protests uh, in the major public square in Hama. Uh, ironically, it's called Sahat al Asi. Asi means uh, the disobedient. They call the river that Hama's la- uh, f- um, sitting on the disobedient river because it flows in the opposite direction of the other <laughs> rivers in the region, uh, similar to the Nile. So, um, so they're all sitting there in this disobedient square and chanting and protesting and saying things, uh, following uh, the lead of this man. Um, and, you know, honestly, like, it, they wouldn't, the things he said wouldn't get a, a, a G rating here in the U.S., but given the repression there, given how much people were afraid to speak out, saying something as simple as, you know, screw you, Mr. President, uh, you, could, you could hear and see how much of an impact it had on the people. That would, you know, shivers down their spine. They would be yelling and cheering. Um, and so... It was basically about a couple of months after he started to see these clips popping up on YouTube and people really joining in uh, that the regime decided to uh, to take him out. And this person was um, essentially murdered. Uh, he had his vocal cords ripped out and he was thrown in the river. His body was found in the river. And, and it's pretty clear why that happened? Absolutely then. clear that it was because of what he said and uh, to send a message to people who wanted to speak out. Now there's another example, uh, not quite as brutal, but still awful, um, Malik Jandali, who's a Syrian-American piano player here in the U.S., um, who had, uh, who was from Homs, which is one of the hardest hit cities uh, this time around, uh, had his family members, um, well, he played at a protest rally in Washington, D.C. Uh, last summer, and he was just playing piano, uh, and he ended up having his family back in Homs, his parents, his two elderly parents uh, were beaten up brutally, uh, handcuffed, thrown in a bathtub, uh, broken bones, broken, you know, blue, black eyes, everything. Wow. Um, and so, you know, that, that again shows you that you can be thousands of miles away and it still has an impact on your family. Now, you mentioned earlier your family has essentially left Syria. My uh, immediate family. Your immediate yeah. family, uh-huh. and that's partially um, because of your uh, sure, decision yeah. to speak out. Mm-hmm. But also just because of the circumstances as well. Of course. You know, yeah. Has the government specifically named you? And your work? Um, well, as I said, yeah, I've been told uh, officially by people quite high up. You see, I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, so the uh, the former ambassador to Syria is now the current foreign minister, uh, <laughs> and the Syrian community in Washington, D.C. is not that big, so it wouldn't take long for them to put my face to the name and to really recognize, you know, what I was doing. So I wasn't surprised by that, um, and it's not really something I'm trying to test. I'm not going to show up at the border and just, you know. Uh, but at the same time, I've been very close, you know. I've, I've done shows in Beirut since then, which is very close, you know, in Jordan. Uh, I've gone visit my family in Dubai and Beirut, and it's the first time I've ever gone that close and not gone to Syria, you know, and that's been very, very difficult for me, but at the same time... Um, you know, uh, I think that there's certain sacrifices you just have to make in life. And I really know, I believe in my heart that I'll be back there sooner, you know, sooner than later. So let's talk about your music. Um, okay. uh, you performed your song Syria at, uh, I understand, at a rally this year in D.C., the one year anniversary of mm-hmm. the start of the conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, but you held off initially mm-hmm. from going public with the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were the reasons you held off and why did you finally choose to perform it? Uh, for the very reasons I just told you. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, I had written the song last August uh, during the first day of Ramadan. Uh, it was the bloodiest, so a a bloodiest day in Hama since uh, 1982. Uh, they had killed uh, over, I think, almost 200 people that day. Uh, and so, you know, I got very motivated. I wrote this song, recorded it. Um, and But I knew I couldn't I couldn't release it with my, with my family there. You know, it was just too risky, and it would be reckless of me, you know, to be sitting here in the comfort of my home in Los Angeles. Uh, putting out music that could endanger the lives of, of my loved ones. And so as much as some of them may have wanted me to release it, I knew the others who were uncomfortable with it, that was enough for me to not do it yet. And so until I got their blessing, uh, I couldn't release it. And it just so happened to be right around the one-year anniversary that uh, they had either left or they felt that things were in a situation where that you know they were f- more comfortable with that being the case. And you know, I put it out, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that actually at that rally, I just did it a cappella. That was the first time I did the verses publicly. Um, and uh, and then I ended up subsequently releasing the video for the song a couple days later. And um, mm-hmm. it's like 140,000 YouTube hits later, you know. Yeah. In your song, you say, I have a dream this regime will fall and that what comes next will be better for us all. Mm. Do you take a position on the various political sides, the groups that are fighting? the regime um, and 
the people that may represent what comes next, if and when the Assad regime falls, I should say when, because that's looking more likely. Uh, yeah, it, it is looking more likely. And it's also looking likely that this will be uh, maybe, I think, chaotic is the word for a while, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and that's what this regime kind of wants. It's doing that, uh, what, what I like to liken to Scarface at the end of the movie, where it's if I can't have it, nobody else can. And he's right. just, you know, kind of tearing everything down um, in spite. But I think, yes, that means that, you know, uh, if, if it eventually leads to true democracy where the people of Syria can vote for who they want, I don't think it's anybody's place to say, you know, who they should vote for. You know, I've, I've seen that happen a lot. Uh, people are upset that certain Islamist groups are being voted in Tunisia and in Egypt. And honestly, I think as long as these people are working within a democratic system where within four years they're gonna, we're going to see what they did and didn't do and be held accountable for it, you know, then that's fine, you know, because these, these groups, these particular Islamist groups have been out, have been in exile for a long time. They were the ones who were able to, to galvanize and to create political movements stronger than any other kind of parties. Uh, and so they're, they're the ones who are ready to take it now. But at the end of the day, uh, whether or not they're truly the ones who can best represent their nation has yet to be determined. Nobody ever gave them a shot. I'm not saying I would necessarily want them. But if they get voted by the majority of the people and they do or don't do their job, again, democracy will take its course and we'll see, you know, whether or not that's the case. Mm -hmm. And so... Well, we've seen so many uh, different examples of how these revolutions can play out. Just in the past year in Egypt, there was an overwhelmingly nonviolent um, mm -hmm. movement. And now we're seeing a, a military uh, regime in Libya we saw a movement that started nonviolent um, turn into an armed movement and then a NATO intervention. Mm -hmm. Syria is uh, another case altogether, and mm -hmm. we're seeing more and more calls from not just uh, people in Congress, but even the media. Nicholas Kristof had a, mm -hmm. an op-ed um, calling for intervention in Syria, mm -hmm. um, saying that more people have died in Syria than in Libya. So uh, all of these examples of the different ways in which the revolutions have unfolded. Tunisia, of course, is its own example. Mm -hmm. Which one of these do you feel has been the truest to democracy or, or the, the most ideal way in which something could have unfolded? Uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of room for cynicism here mm -hmm. because there's so many foreign interests yeah. um, and so many other things at play. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said about what you just said. F you know, first of all, two million people die in Africa and nobody bats an eye, you mm -hmm. know. So when it comes to the numbers, I don't think that really affects the people's decisions of whether or not they go in there. It's, it's strategically what, what, what's in it for them. We all know why they went into Libya. We all know why they don't really want to go into Syria. It's too tricky and sticky. And actually, uh, let me on that note yeah. quote um, from the op-ed that Christoph wrote, he quoted William Perry, Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton, who said that if he were in the Pentagon today, he would be recommending a military intervention conditioned on Turkey's participation and without ground forces. Specifically, he said uh, he would favor imposing a no-fly zone. He said it isn't a full strategy, but it could facilitate the overthrow of Assad and have a real humanitarian benefit. He added, and if successful, it could help us influence the post-Assad government, mm -hmm. which I think is the key point, right? Of course, yeah, and that's what everybody wants. Uh, that's why Russia and China keep vetoing, because they want to make sure that their interests are taken care of. They have, Russia at least has its only Mediterranean naval base uh, in Syria, and they want to maintain that type of influence. Iran obviously has its other reasons. And so when people talk about foreign intervention, they also don't mention the fact that there already is foreign intervention right. by these other powers. And uh, the U.S. is supplying you know, arms to the rebels. Obviously, so the U.S. is supplying arms to the rebels. They've already spoken about the CIA being there uh, on the ground. And so, um, you know, whether or not pe the boots are actually on the ground, you know, there's already influence. That's, that is the problem, I think, is the fact that, you know, all these other countries want to determine Syria's fate. And what this began as was the Syrian people saying enough, you know, we've had enough of that and we want to take our fate and our destiny into our own hands. Um, and so... Um, just to backtrack, sorry, what was the... the, the well, my the question was, how have you? do you feel one example or another of, of any of these revolutions oh, right. was the sort of more, most ideal way? Some people cite Tunisia, for mm. example, as being sort of the, the, the purest or truest to a nonviolent revolution sure. that we've seen in the Arab world. And maybe Libya is the worst example, or maybe Syria is the worst example. <sighs> yeah, um, or Bahrain, because it's still, you, go, you know, yeah. nobody's even talking about right. it. Uh, so I don't know if there's any best or worst example. What I do know is that the dictator falling is just the very first step in a long process that will hopefully eventually lead to uh, the positive change that we're looking for. And it's easy to get cynical about it. It's easy to be, easy to be fatalistic. I mean, that's what our parents' generations were for so long. Um, but 
you know, the difference today is there, there's there's a whole new level of accountability um, with the internet, with things like WikiLeaks, with YouTube, and people kind of feel like back in Hama in 1982, there were no camera phones, no cell phones, no YouTube, Twitter, so nobody heard about it. It came and went. There was two articles written about it, Robert Fisk and maybe Thomas Friedman boasts about how he wrote it in his book. Um, <laughs> but uh, honestly, nobody nobody really knew what happened. Now we live in a different day and age where we see it happening, uh, and, and uh, we have a lot more voices being amplified as to what is taking place and not taking place. And you actually can hear what the Syrian people themselves are saying. If you just get on Twitter, I know not everybody speaks Arabic. You know, I get to read direct tweets from people inside Syria, activists inside Syria, uh, whether they're family members or friends, etc., who are who are talking about what's happening now. You know, like my cousin saying, "Wow, there was just an explosion downstairs. I'm in this internet cafe. Whoa, I just saw a you know plane go overhead." So it's a completely different day and age where uh, you know we have this type of accountability, and that is hopefully what I think will uh, get us to the better place that we need to be when these governments start to understand that people will really call them out immediately when they do things wrong. Uh, just the other day, there was this minister who was caught in Lebanon for uh, uh, basically plotting to assassinate some, you know, some pro-revolution uh, kind of uh, ministers in, in Lebanon who were supporting Syria, supporting the opposition, um, you know, and that's like immediately happened. He didn't even mm. have a chance to make it happen before people caught him, you know, so... It's interesting. So I can't say I, I'm I'm definitely hopeful. You know, I hear yes, I hear good things about what happened in Tunisia. I hear people be cynical about it as well. Mm -hmm. I hear Libyans tell me it's not as bad as everybody's saying it is and mm -hmm. that it's much better today than it ever was under Gaddafi. Uh, I hear Syrians tell me that as bloody as it is today, there's never been a better time to be Syrian. Uh, you know, we're finally able to speak out and say what we want to say mm -hmm. and that this is, you know, that those very two difficult words to swallow, but necessary evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and, and also they say, look at Iraq. I mean, that was that was the unnatural way of going about this, and this is us taking it into our own hands. Iraq was the, you know, one of the worst examples of foreign intervention in the region. Uh, it still makes no sense what's happening there, and uh, that's what they don't want to see take place in Syria. Now, when they also talk about Islamic, you know, or Islamist governments, you could technically say Turkey's is, but it keeps being boasted as the model for reform in the region. So... You know, uh, Turkey had its own unique history. Every single one of these countries does. You know, they had the backlash from Ataturk to, to get to where they are. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. I don't think you can flatten them all out. Uh, there's that really funny part in, uh, was it Family Guy or American Dad, where he's flying over the Middle East, looking out down at the window, and it's just the map of the Middle East. And that's what it feels like people on, you know, in the news kind of just right. do, you know. That that's what it is. And they have a few buzzwords about what they think it is. And it's so much more complex and, and layered than that. Uh, and I think also... Um, with all due respect, you know, I'm an American, but I just feel like America doesn't have its, uh, the right to tell other people how to, how to run a democracy, really. I mean, look at what they've done. Look at the history of what they've done versus what they, actually, what the, versus what they say or what we say. Uh, and we have to be very serious about that. We have so much stuff to clean up here in our own country, you know, uh, whether it's the billions of dollars we're using to fund these senseless wars, Afghanistan, the longest war in U.S. history, where we have a broken education system and, you know, there's just so much more that mm -hmm. we can be doing focusing here, you know. Well, finally, Omar, what's next for you uh, professionally as a musician? Mm -hmm. I understand you're working on another album now? That's right. Yeah, I'm working on a new record. I've uh, been kind of off and on working on it for a while. What's taking place in Syria just kind of, you know, drains me in different ways. Um, uh, but... You know, I'm trying to focus on it and get it done, hopefully before the end of the year. I'm working with Sami Matar, who's the, uh, the, the artist who produced, uh, composed uh, Hashtag Jan25 and Hashtag Syria, the two songs that you mentioned in the beginning. And given the success of those two, I'm hoping that people will take you know, to, this, to this new record. Uh, he's a classically trained composer and a hip-hop producer, so you know, it'll sound different. Uh, and obviously everything that's happening in the Middle East and happening here in America, uh, as always, will play a role in what I you know, talk about. So. Is your music being heard inside Syria? It is, yeah, definitely. It you is. You know, feedback? what's cool? What's another cool thing about you know this internet age is that you can see where the hits are coming from. Mm. You know, yeah. So I can actually see how many of the thousands are coming from inside Syria. Although uh, many people use proxy servers mm. inside Syria just to be safe, and so you know the bulk of those that become that are coming from Saudi Arabia or other neighboring countries could very well be coming from inside Syria as well. Um, but I know, yeah. I mean, I talk to kids on Facebook, on on YouTube, or on Twitter, you know, and I and I see that that they're listening to it, and um, you know, one of the one of the 
One of the coolest things that's happened is uh, th there's a group of activists inside and outside Syria who are developing what they call stamps of the revolution. Right, and I heard uh, your face is on a stamp. So my face is on a stamp. Yeah, these that's are amazing. stamps that they say hopefully when, when, when Syria is free that they can become the, you know, the, the stamps for a free Syria. And so anybody who's sacrificed in any sort of way uh, gets a stamp and they eventually made one for me where I'm side by side with this figure, Ibrahim Qashu, who's from Hama. So um, needless to say, that was an honor and... Uh, you know, I hope to see it on a stamp one day in a free Syria. More, more so, see a free Syria than see the stamp. But yeah. So you feel that even though you're so far away, you're able to make some kind of difference through your music. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I. Music is used to inspire people. It's, you know, what you remember years later um, from a revolution, you know. Uh, we have so many revolutionary songs from South Africa, from America, etc., that we remember fondly. And so uh, it, it's that universal language that can play that role in, in kind of encapsulating, you know, the memories of, 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 of a particular time. Uh, but I also, you know, want to stress that what I'm doing is solidarity work. The music that the people of Syria are creating day in and day out in the streets protesting, chanting in those Arada events that I'm telling you about and, and the songs created by artists inside Syria, that's the real music of the revolution, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm proud to be able to consider myself part of, you know, that soundscape perhaps, but really the, those who, who deserve the most credit are those who are, are making the bigger sacrifices and so. Omar, I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Best of luck to you and your Thank work. you so much. Thank you.